Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two widows held up for an example to embarrass us. To embarrass us. As a witness of what God requires of us, which is total trust in Him. And these two widows, the widow of Zarephath and the woman in, uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, both of these women had next to nothing. And what they did have of value, they gave to the Lord. Uh, we talked with the kids about the, uh, the woman uh, in the temple in Jerusalem and uh, the widow of Zarephath at the time of Elijah. First, that one, we know more about her, so we'll talk a little bit more about her this morning. Uh, Elijah, this was the time of, uh, of the prophets of Elijah, and uh, he was primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, he was uh, speaking, and this was particularly the time of King Ahab and his infamous wife Jezebel. He was in somewhat conflict, and conflict with them because as prophets often were, as they spoke the word of God and uh, bringing condemnation upon frequently the leaders and the people of Israel uh, for not following God, but following their own way. And part of the illustration then is that God told uh, Elijah that he could tell uh, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel that because of their uh, lack of respect and, and relationship to God, that there was going to be a drought and a famine across the land until God told, Abra told uh, Elijah, and Elijah would give the word, and it would all be over, and God would again send the rain. Well, you can imagine how uh, yeah, they were, Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, was often putting out a contract on, on Elijah's life, and uh, so uh, she, uh, uh, Elijah decided he would go hide out in a cave near the Jordan River for a while, which worked out fine until the, draw, until the uh, drought dried up the river that he was uh, just outside of, and where then the, the ravens would bring him bread uh, to, to eat, so he had bread and water during that length of time. But uh, the river dried up, so God says, well, I have now a plan for you to go to, uh, well, we'll put it where it sounds, sounds nice rather than what it was. He says, I have a place for you. It's uh, near a resort town on the Mediterranean, overlooking the Med, and uh, just, uh, you know, so go, uh, go over there. There's a, uh, uh, there's a woman there that, that I have prepared to, uh, uh, to, to take care of you while you're there. And, uh, of course, uh, that means it was a widow, and she lived in, uh, in uh, Zarephath, which was a, a distant suburb, a sub suburb of... Uh, uh, I had a professor, Serber, and uh, uh, so that sometimes that comes back up when, instead of suburb. Uh, it uh, confuses my brain. All right. But a suburb of uh, Sidon. And uh, so, and Zarephath, and so Elijah went there. God said, you'll find her. Well, when he got there, outside the gates of the city, there was a woman there gathering uh, sticks as we later learn, for fireplace, for fire, to make breakfast. And uh, it's kind of strange that she would give you an idea how poor she was, uh, because you're not going to find that kind of fire sticks, if you will, firewood, at the gate of the city. What was near the gate of the city was the, uh, the threshing floor, where they separated the wheat, uh, or the other grains from the chaff, the weeds, and all that kind of stuff, and the shells. And so she was picking up kindling, you know, the, the, the stalks from, from that. That's the that's best she could do. And while she's there, uh, Elijah comes up and asks her for some water. And so she begins to go get that, and he says, And oh, by the way, while you're at that, uh, bring me some bread to eat. I'm going to starve. And, I mean, there first place, let me say that, that uh, hosting strangers in those days had a much stronger impetus. That was the culture. 
when someone came, you didn't know them, but they were getting, and obviously he's outside the city, so, and, and she recognized him as not one that belonged here. She recognized him as an Israelite. They dress funnier, I guess, and uh, recognized that. And uh, uh, so she comes to them and says, uh, uh, actually, she goes, what we would say, uh, formally in court, she begins to swear, you know, I know. And uh, today we'd say, uh, are you, we used to say in courts, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Well, that's what she says. In the name of your God, you know, I tell you the truth, that uh, I, don't, I don't have much. She says, I'm out here collecting this fire starter to do enough fire to go home. I have just enough flour and oil to make uh, one more meal of bread, and then uh, the nothing left, my son and I will die. And uh, uh, so Elijah says, well, go make me some first. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what a selfish guy. But then he says, God of Israel says, and that's what she's already recognized. He's from Israel and recognized God. She'd heard about this, as foreigners do. This was not in Israel territory. This was outside of Israel. Phoenicia. This was out, you know, this was over on the Mediterranean coast. But she had heard of the God of Israel and, and believed in his power. And so Elijah said, the God of Israel has word for you that is that as long as the drought and the famine is operating, your flour bin will never be empty. And the pitcher of oil will never run out. And so she goes home and she uses her flour and oil and she makes bread for Elijah and gives it to him. And then she has, ah, surprise, flour and oil to make for her son and herself. And they eat. And that went on for all the days that Elijah was there with her. Now, just so that you understand that it might be risky to uh, give all like that to the Lord, uh, she obviously thought that, uh, you know, I have done this great deed, and God is doing this miracle in my house. You know, boy, the Lord loves me, and is taking care of me, and permitting me uh, to take care of his prophet Elijah. Because the reason Elijah had to go over there was, that uh, if the uh, uh, Ahab or Jezebel or their, their emissaries found him uh, wandering around looking for food or water, see, then they would take him to the palace and use whatever means they had available to them in those days to uh, uh, elicit from him a confession and that he would, uh, that he would declare the, the, the uh, drought and the famine over, and God would rain on them again. And so God moved him out of town, out of the country. And that's why he's with the woman. But staying with her, it didn't always go that well. The next verses talk about that uh, the woman's son got sick and died. And in her, in her loss, in her mourning, you know, and anger is a part of that, her anger turned at Elijah and the God of Israel. And he said, why did you come here to me? I could, my son is, is, is dead, and, and what have I got to live for? Well, what good is now is this, this bread and oil that, that won't quit now for me? He says, your coming here has just brought the God of Israel's attention to me, and he's now punished me for my sin. And people thought that in those days too. Said, why is all this happening to me? What great sin have I have done that to deserve... This kind of thing, Job said nothing, and he was right. But uh, and, and today, we do the same thing. Said, Does God punish us for our sins? No, not unless he tells us that's what he's doing. And he doesn't do that anymore because he's taking care of that. But in those days, before God punished the people, he sent a prophet to tell them that. I'm sort of a New Testament prophet, as are you, by the way. And uh, that's part of our job as Okay, let's go back to that. <laughs> okay. 
So she thought, she said, of what good is it for you to be here in the God of Israel and all that kind of stuff if he's here to punish me for my sins? And Elijah says, that's okay. We'll talk to God about this. And so Elijah goes up to the room and prays over the boy, asks God to breathe life into him again. And then uh, Elijah threw himself upon the boy several times, and God breathed life back into the boy, came alive, and Elijah handed him to, uh, to his mother. All right. She gave of all she had, even thinking that, well, this might make all things good and you know, the normal events of life. You know, I trust God now. Nothing bad is going to happen. He's going to provide everything for me. Yes. But it doesn't mean that he's going to provide everything that we think we need or we want. God knows what we need, and he makes that available to us. Same thing with the woman uh, in Jerusalem that was there. Jesus had just talked to the people, the crowd, about uh, and to the disciples, uh, warning them against their scribes. See, the scribes, we hear about the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, generally speaking, the Pharisees were of the upper class, the scribes not so much. And uh, many of them didn't have a job. They lived on what they could, what they could get, garner from the offerings and so forth. And many of them, as scribes, which were more of the lawyer type, uh, and they had, uh, they often served. Uh, we call today executors of the estates, so that when the man died, they would manage the money for the widows, so that they would have ongoing uh, support. Uh, but as Jesus said, uh, as in today when uh, we have legal minds uh, in uh, charge of, uh, of the states, uh, often the uh, state lawyers can find uh, methodologies of garnering a great deal of the uh, uh, total value of the estate, uh, sometimes such that the beneficiaries get uh, little or nothing of the original estate. Uh, I'll tell you about that. But the, uh, uh, that's what happens sometimes. And, and, and so he said, there's, you know, there's room for uh, misappropriation of, of, of the uh, estate, even in, in the days of Jesus. And so he warned them against it. He says, you know, you, you recognize these guys. They wear very nice, very nice robes in town. You know, and everybody recognizes, aha, these are the scribes. And, and very nice robes, and, they, and uh, they expect to be invited to all the nice you know, uh, banquets, and they want the, the fine seats in the banquet, and uh, so forth, and, and they're the ones that, that they pray, and they'll pray forever about everything, and, and eloquent language on, and on, and on, and on, to see how beautiful they can pray, and uh, so you're, 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 you know, you're just wonderment at their, at their handling of the language, and so forth, uh, not really thinking about what they're praying about, for them, neither are they, they're just speaking, but okay. He said, beware of them. And uh, their reward is here, and that's about all they're going to get. Because they're gonna, God is going to hold them responsible for all of their actions. And then this widow, Jesus positions himself uh, probably in the position between where the court of the women were at the temple, where they worshipped, and then the court of the men. Just there, there was, uh, I think, a, a dozen, or one for each of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. But there was... Uh, uh, not offering boxes if, uh, like we might be familiar or offering plates, but it was more like, well, I, when I read the description, it reminded me, have you ever been in the stores? Or I think, do we still have our little dinosaur back there? But uh, you go in the stores and they have these contraptions there and you put the coin in the top and it goes down the bottom. Clink. Don't get anything for that. You just it's the joy of watching it go through. Well, see, they had these twelve things at at the temple. Now these were, and it was almost like a funnel, and went into, and then it, and it went around and around and around and around and around down to the box. Someplace. Well, they didn't have paper money or checks in those days. All they had were coins. And so the people who were, you know, wanted to, and have lots of big heavy coins silver and gold and other kinds of things like that, you know. And they come in and they could just, you know, if they have a bunch of them, say, we'll put one in each one. 
to start one here, and it'd be like those guys that keep the plates moving, you know, but it, on the stick. And so they put one in, and it goes clang, 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 clang. So everybody says, wow, look at them. They're putting a lot of offering in the plates, yeah, in the box. Yeah. So they call attention to themselves. You know. Around, clang, 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 the noisy noise, or a whole bunch of them at once, you know. <laughs> Then you get this widow lady that nobody's paying any attention to whatsoever. She comes in and drops those two, like, about the size of an eighth of a penny today. And uh, this is where, oh, by the way, the, the, our Lutheran Women's Missionary League ladies, the, the LWML, you know, they have mic boxes. That's an English term, and uh, I've forgotten what it was, an eighth of a farthing or whatever that means. And uh, uh, so they, I didn't live, I only passed through I didn't pick up, I didn't have to figure out what their thing was. But anyway, uh, pounds, that's dollars. I don't know what it is today, about two and a half pounds for the dollar. But uh, that I can remember sometimes. But a mic is an English term, and it's an eighth of a something, but not very much. And it was copper, so it didn't weigh much either. And so the little widow comes, and she puts all she has, those two little, and it doesn't even make a whisper as it goes in. Because it doesn't, it doesn't plan anything. But Jesus is watching, and because he is also God, he knows that this woman, out of faith and trust in God, this is all the money she had left, and she put it in the offering at the temple. That's all. See, that was with the kids. I, was gonna, I thought about having enough to give each of them two pennies and let them put it in the offering plate. But that means I had to find it, and then that means that the counters would have to count it later. And uh, so it's good as many kids as we had today. That was a good thing. I probably wouldn't have had that many. But uh, anyway. So. But we're going to get to put our offering in. And we have this Old Testament and this New Testament examples for us to say, what's your trust level before the Lord? When you give your offering to God, do you give of your abundance or of your poverty? In other words, does it hurt a little bit to give? Does it take a little bit out of you to give your offering? This is a great time because it used to be traditionally in November because we're talking about the budget. This is a great you know, stewardship sermon. Uh-huh. Well, I preach it all year long. So anyway, this just has to be the text for today. So it's, it's, do your offerings reflect your trust in God? Or your offerings like the, off, the first offerings we hear about in the Old Testament, which was the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, Cain who presented his offerings to the Lord. He was a farmer and raised grain. And what he offered to the Lord was chaff and trash and stuff good for building little fires to do breakfast, but not much more. And then when his little brother Abel, who was a sheep herder, and his offering he presented to the Lord, was the finest of his flock that he offered to the Lord. And God welcomed his offering because it was the best that he had to give. As opposed to Cain, who offered the worst that he had, just because he had to do it, he got rid of it that way. From the very beginning, God accepted Abel's offering, did not accept Cain's offering, and Cain was jealous of Abel that God accepted his offering. And his jealousy led him, of course, to kill his brother. Hopefully you're not involved in your looking at your offerings, if you will, that uh, uh, takes you to the point that you want to kill the prophet who's teaching you today. But what it does is to bring us attention of what are we doing with the gifts that God has given us. 
It is with these gifts and our offerings that we have the resources to take care of what God has given to us as a church. We're looking at the budget today. And, you know, outside of a little bit that we have in, uh, uh, in my discretionary fund, uh, you know, we really haven't allocated anything to, in our budget to support Germantown Health, to support the social services of, of the county, to support other uh, helping agencies in, in, in our area who, who uh, organize and assist people whom they have determined are really in need of, of gifts and, and help and support. You know that some congregations make available to the Montgomery County Social Services after they've reviewed everything, they have, they have a special account that, and we let them know that says we have, when, when you spend it all other resources and folks who really need it, that we can help. We, we don't even do that. Are we really aware of, of, of the people? Sometimes we find out of some of our fellowship that are in dire need. They, they're either underemployed or unemployed. And, and they had trouble you know, making, making ends meet. Have we, have we done anything? I said, some of us have thought about that. There's some that we have found out about. That's the other thing, see? Is it, uh, we really don't trust each other. We, we want to still look good, you know? So we come to church and we put our envelope in. That's why we give you envelopes. See, we don't, uh, the only people that see how much you're giving are the counters because they have to record all that kind of stuff. But we put it in an envelope, so unless you bark it on the outside, and you don't have to do that, you know, then nobody knows how much you're giving each week. So you can, you can put nothing in your envelope. You know, the only ones who know are the counters. Or you can put a, like, a, I remember folks that, oh, they're, they're very generous. They give $5 every time they come, whenever that is. Well, it's, I think earlier this year I used a thing, uh, uh, catechism, we teach about that uh, uh, you're robbing God. But anyway, I, I, I won't get that harsh today. I, I won't mention that. But it's when we recognize that what we're talking about is our offerings are an expression of our trust in God. Do we trust Him to take care of it? Do we trust Him that we support the work and the ministry of this temple such that we can, you know, we have to, we keep paring our budget down. Why? Because the money keeps our needs. We try to not let them grow too much. And so we try to see how, how little we can keep our budget. Uh, we used to call it a faith budget. I'm not sure we can do that anymore. Because we're not, we're not, we're not pushing it. We're not expressing our faith budget. We're expressing how much we think we can get away with. How little we can give. That's not everybody. That's not everybody. There's some folks who are doing a fine job. And I think they're, they're, they're tithing to some degree. Tithing is a good process. You know what tithings are? The Old Testament, which we're not bound to anymore, but it's certainly a good guide. God required his people of Israel and Judah, 10% gross. Not net, gross. 10% before that FICA guy or anybody else takes anything out. Gross. That was the tithe. That didn't count offerings, all different kinds of offerings on top of that. Special offerings, thank offerings, uh, sin offerings, uh, all sorts of stuff. That was a guy. And, and if you want to take a look at the possibility of starting a tithe, start with 1%. Start with 1% of gross. And each year increase it a little bit. And then say, you know, after you attain this level of income, you couldn't get any lower than the two little copper coins that the widow put in the plate. That's all she had and that's all she put in. She put it in. We're talking about a tithe. There's a tithe of whatever your gross income is. And that also included the herbs in your garden. I don't know what we're going to do with it when you bring those in, but anyway. 
10% of your herb growth or your, your, your yard, your vegetables and stuff. <clears throat> I, I've seen congregations that do that and they share with people and they bring it in and they take it home. And occasionally that happens here amongst us. Now, see the point here. When Jesus called to attention that that woman had just given all that she had, this was three days before Jesus was going to give all that he had on the cross. And he had already given up all that is of God. All the power. The omnipotence. The omnipresence. The omniscience. The everything that God... And he had set that aside to become a human being. A man. And be, did not come as a king. He didn't even come as a prince of earthly kings. He came as an infant in a very poor family and lived that. And now he was about to give everything that when he was crucified on the cross, what did he own? The clothes that he had. And where did that go? That went traditionally to his executioners. And that's why they divided up everything that was brought with him. And then because he had a special cloak, and rather than ripping it up so that each one would have a part of it, for whatever good that's going to do them, add it to the other parts from the other robes like that uh, that they might get. Instead, they cast lots so that one of them could be the possessor of the robe of Jesus of Nazareth. I think they made a movie of that. But that, he had nothing. Like all of us. He came into the world like all the rest of us do, except that his father was a little different. <laughs> and he went out the same way we're all going to go, naked. And hopefully, we won't leave as, just as damaged as his body was <coughs> by disease or accident or some other thing. But he gave all. And that's what, and the reason he gave is for blood. He had to give his blood. That was the way it was from the very beginning. Required the blood. Death, in other words, for sin. Cain's death was postponed, but he died. Adam and Eve died. Noah died. And so did everybody else except Enoch. We'll talk about that later. And Elijah and Jesus. Jesus died. He died for the sins of all humanity. Now, it's a little misleading in the text in the back when he said he died for many. There's much better translations than that. That's just the customary one. There's an article that gets left out, so it's the many, meaning we have Jesus, and then the many, meaning everybody. There's a better translation that talks about humanity. Then the only ones that are left out are those insisting that, that, that it's, that's gender specific and it doesn't apply to them. <laughs> yes, it does. Humanity. He died for all peoples. Ever. And it took care of sin for all. That's what he came the first time to do. To take care of sin. They thought he was also coming in a judgment. That's the next visit. At the end of time. See, we don't have to worry about our judgment. God has provided for us all we need. Which is ultimately forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Everything else is for time. Our reputation that, that the scribes uh, coveted. That's only for time. Maybe for a little while after. If you are really great stuff, they might remember you, or horrible, they may remember you for a long time. But most of us now have to do a great deal of research to find out who our ancestors were. Because nobody cares anymore. But Jesus does. He died for everybody's sin. So that when He comes again, you know that everybody's going to be made alive. Their body and their spirits are going to be joined together. 
He's going to take his sheep with him into heaven. And all the goats, uh, those who knew of Jesus, but would not receive his sacrifice for all sin. Who don't think that it was a, enough for all of us. You know, I'm so horrible, you know, God must have be punished, needs to punish me for my sin. He did. Jesus on the cross. So next time he's coming in judgment. The past judgment. Sheep, over here. Goats, over there. Apart from God and God's children. That's what Hebrews talks very clearly about. That's what Jesus is all about. He's not like the high priest before. They had to do that Yom Kippur with blood splashing on the altar in the Holy of Holies every year. And they had to continue doing the sacrifices, which they did, oh, by the way, until 70 A.D. when they... Romans finally destroyed the temple and destroyed sacrifices. The Jews don't do that anymore. It's the influence of Christianity. Jesus came, the Messiah, and he did it once for all. That's what Hebrews talks about today. Hebrews text. Our trust in God. Who do you trust? When you place in a few moments your offering in the offering plates, is it what's left over from your abundance? Or is it indicative of your recognition of your poverty before God? And that everything we have belongs to who came from Him, particularly everything good comes from Him. He still owns it. He loans it to us to be stewards of it until Christ comes. God bless you and hold on to you. May you continue by the power of the Holy Spirit, word and sacrament to strengthen you. Trust God above all things. Until Jesus comes, 